Hi and welcome back everyone. In this video, I'll show you how to store NFT images and its metadata on IPFS and how to store NFTs along with its off-chain data in a database. If you're new in here, hey, I'm Robert and in this YouTube series, you'll learn how to build a full-stack NFT marketplace with or without lazy minting. If you have not seen the live demo in the first video yet, then please do so now before watching this video. So what actually is IPFS? Well, IPFS is a quote, protocol and peer-to-peer -peer network to store and share data in a distributed file system. So basically we use it to store NFT images and its metadata in a decentralized and immutable way, way cheaper than on the blockchain. There are many gateways available for it. However, in this tutorial, we interact with IPFS through the Infura gateway. But note, we do this through our backend APIs, since Infura requires you to provide credentials now, which we don't want to share on the client side. Are you wondering why we actually need a database in a blockchain environment? Well, lazy minted NFTs are not minted on the blockchain until they get purchased. So we need a way to store NFTs along with the lazy minted sales orders. For this purpose, we use MongoDB, which is a document oriented database. Before we get started, please click the like and the subscribe button, but also the notification bell below. Now let's get to it. All right, we start with implementing IPFS through the Infura gateway. For this purpose, we open the service IPFS.js file in the services directory, which we created in the last tutorial. In the first line, we import the IPFS HTTP client and we name the create module as IPFS HTTP client. In order to use this IPFS HTTP client, we have to install it first. We do this by running npm install IPFS HTTP client in the terminal window. Then we write the function get IPFS client. And this function will return us an Infura client, which we will use each time we want to interact with IPFS. You may have seen Infura client implementations like this in other projects, but please be aware that this does not work anymore since Infura requires you now to authenticate in order to pin your data. And if your data doesn't get pinned, it gets deleted after some time and that's definitely something you don't like. Therefore, we implement the client as follows. With this approach, you can enter your Infura project ID and your Infura project secret here. And here we create the base64 encoded authorization string for Infura. And we pass this authorization string in the header as follows. Then we write the function create IPFS URL, which takes any data object as argument. Here you can see that we use the get IPFS client function, which we've written before here to connect to Infura. Here we add the past data to the client, which stores it on IPFS. We can access the edit path with edit.path and create the URL like so. Finally, we return the URL. Now we could call this function create IPF URL from the front end for storing the NFT image and NFT metadata on IPFS. But we don't do it because we do not want to make the project ID and the project secret of Infura available on the client side. Therefore, we switch to the backend APIs that we created in the last episode in the pages API 
NFT directory and here we open the create.js file and we call the service ipfs.create ipfs url function here. We call this function to store images when the action of this backend API was create image in IPFS. And we also call it when the action is create metadata in IPFS. But this time we expect to get a JSON object. In this case, the function stores the metadata on IPFS. Now we can switch to our front end components in the components directory and open the create and sell.js component. Here in the front end, we can now call this backend function service API.create image in IPFS and pass the NFT image as argument. As a result, we get an object with an image attribute which contains the path to the IPFS image. We output it here so that we can check it on the developer console later. When the user clicks the create and sell button, we run the create and sell function here. And in this function, we build the metadata from the form input. Our metadata object now contains fields like name of the NFT, description of the NFT, but also the contract address of the NFT collection. And here we convert the Ether price of the NFT to weigh and store it in the data object. And here we create the metadata on IPFS by calling our backend function service API.create metadata in IPFS. And we pass the data object, the metadata object. As a result, we receive the token URI attribute of the result object or in the result object, which contains the link to our new uh, metadata on IPFS. Now we can open our app in the browser again and click on upload a file. Here we can choose the NFT image which we want to upload. If we open the developer console, we now can see the link to the uploaded image on IPFS. If we click this link, we can also see this uploaded image here. Now we can enter the NFT metadata in the form. And then we click the create and sell button. If we open the developer console again, we now can also see the link to the metadata. We click on this link. And on this IPFS link, we can now see all the metadata that we've entered along with the image that we have uploaded. Now we create the database layer for our project. As a database, we use MongoDB, which is a document-oriented database. To install MongoDB, you have several options. You either can install it locally in your development environment, or you can use Docker to install and run it in your development environment or you use a cloud provider like Google, Amazon, or Microsoft to run the MongoDB there. Because of performance issues on my local machine, I install MongoDB on a virtual machine in the Google Cloud. But if you guys have Docker installed on your local machine without any performance issues, then you can perform the same steps in your terminal window like I'm doing here. On the other hand, if you want to run MongoDB in the Google Cloud like I do, then create a virtual machine with at least two gigabytes of memory and with a container optimized OS as image. This creates a virtual machine for you with Docker already pre-installed. 
you get an external IP address for this virtual machine. Before we install MongoDB with Docker on this virtual machine, we unlock the MongoDB port address in the Google Cloud Firewall. We create a new firewall rule here and we allow the access to the TCP port 27017. In a production environment, you would either run MongoDB in the same network like your web server or you would restrict the access to MongoDB just for your web server here. Now we SSH into this virtual machine. Here we run MongoDB in a Docker container with this command. Docker run. We name the container MongoDB. We make it available through the MongoDB default port 27017. We immediately detach the container from this terminal window. We mount the volume in the dev mongo directory. And we specify the mongo image that we are using here. Now we can check that the container is running with this command. And we can retrieve an array of all NFTs in the database with this command. What we are doing here is simply we exec into this MongoDB container. And we run a MongoDB command in the shell of this container. We find all NFTs in the MongoDB collection NFTs test and we convert them to an array with this command. And here we specify the name of the MongoDB database. Of course, we get an empty result here because neither the database nor the MongoDB collection is available yet. Now we switch back to our Visual Studio code development environment and we open the .n file here. Here you can specify the MongoDB URI, which basically contains the IP address of your database and the port number of your database and the name of your database. In my case, this is the address of the virtual machine that we previously created. In order to be able to connect to our MongoDB database, we create a mongodb.js file in a new directory lib. You can copy the whole content of this file from the Next.js GitHub. Basically, in, it imports a Mongo client from the MongoDB library and it reads the MongoDB URI from the .end file. Then it creates a new Mongo client and it connects to the database. And finally, it returns a client promise. We install the MongoDB client as follows into our project. Now we switch to the empty servicedb.js file that we created in the services directory in the last video. And here we import the client promise from the MongoDB library that we've just created. The first function we write is get last token ID, which will return us the highest token ID of an NFT available in the database. Here we wait for the client promise, which basically means that we wait until the client is connected to the database. Then we specify the database and the MongoDB collection where our NFTs are stored. 
And here we get the last token ID if an NFT has been created yet. If there is no NFT available, then we return zero. Next, we write the function get documents. This function returns us all documents in the MongoDB collection. So basically, this function returns all NFT items in our database. Next, we write the function get document, which takes the internal MongoDB ID as an argument. And basically, this function returns us one NFT. The create document function takes the data, NFT data as argument and creates the NFT in the database. And finally, we write the function update document, which takes the internal MongoDB ID and the NFT data as arguments. And basically this function updates an NFT with this ID in the database with some new content. Now we can switch to our backend APIs in the API directory and open the create.js file. In this create backend API, we can now create the NFT in the database by calling the service db.create document function, which we created earlier. Also in the underscore id.js backend API, we will use the service DB functions get document and update document once the prerequisites are available. In order to be able to display all NFTs in our database on the home page, we switch to the backend API index.js in the NFTs directory, which is located in the API directory. And here we have created just temporary NFTs. We can remove these temporary NFTs now. And instead we can get the NFTs from the database through our service DB module. If just the last token ID is requested through the query parameter, then we call the service DB get last token ID function. But otherwise, we call the service DB get documents function, which returns us all NFTs. And here we return a JSON response with all NFTs in our database. Now we open the create and sell.js front end component again, and we find the function create and sell here. And if the user creates a new NFT item, then we call the service API.getNextTokenID to get a new token ID. And here we use the service API.createNFTInDB function to create a new NFT in the database. Now we can upload a new NFT image again, enter the name, and this will be our first NFT in the database. We enter the price and then we click create and sell. But this time the NFT is also created in the database. We can check this directly in the database if we switch back to our virtual machine and run this command here again. Here you can see that the NFT is stored in the database along with its IPFS data. So that was it for today, but we're gonna drop some more videos very soon. Please click the like and the subscribe button below and thank you for watching.